Hello, welcome to uh, Unit 5, Chemical Bonding. Uh, and in this unit, we will be discussing different types of chemical bonds and predicting what type of elements form those bonds. And we will start, we'll start with ionic bonding. Ionic bonding occurs because of metals tending to lose electrons and nonmetals tending to gain electrons. This is the general pattern. Uh, so most ionic bonds are formed between a metal and a nonmetal. The metal loses an electron to become a cation, and the nonmetal tends to gain an electron, becoming an anion. And then those two ions attract each other and form a crystalline lattice. And this happens because of the differences in electronegativity between the two species. So our example here is sodium chloride or table salt. And we have a salt crystal here in our picture. Some of these ionic bonds form very beautiful crystalline structures uh, and they have a repeating pattern of ions occurring. Draw a dot structure here. Sodium, one valence electron. Chlorine has seven and you get a transfer of this electron and so you have sodium becoming positively one charged and chlorine becoming negatively one charged to form this crystalline uh, lattice. The sodium ion, since it's lost an electron, the, uh, the ion will be uh, smaller than its original um, element. And chlorine, since it gains one, will become larger than its uh, original element. And you'll see that in sometimes pictures that uh, show a uh, representation of the positive ion being smaller and the negative ion being larger. And you'll have a repeating pattern here. And uh, I'm not doing a great job of drawing this, but uh, that's kind of what you'll see in some uh, uh, kind of a depiction, uh, a pictorial depiction of the ion. And of course, the uh, picture here of the crystal is quite more beautiful than my crude drawing. The atoms are held together by electrostatic forces and the result is a repeating of atoms in a, a lattice or crystalline structure with predictable element ratios. Uh, with sodium chloride the ratio is one to one because sodium tends to lose one and chlorine tends to gain one. In other ionic compounds the ratios might be two to one or two to three. And so we will, uh, when we go over the nomenclature, we'll be able to uh, use a periodic table to predict the ratio of atoms in these ionic compounds. Properties of ionic compounds. They have stronger bonds than covalent compounds. Uh, they uh, have higher melting and boiling points as a result of this. They have a predictable lattice energy uh, and uh, they conduct electricity in water, their electrolytes. And so this electrolytes, uh, this description here goes with electrolytes. So they have a predictable lattice energy and they are electrolytes, which means they conduct electricity in water. Usually uh, people say don't stand in puddles during electrical storms. Well, the conducting of electricity through the water is not usually very great if it's pure water, but if it is water with dissolved solids in it, uh, it certainly becomes more uh, conductive and more dangerous to be around. Okay, metals lose electrons, like we said before, uh, and become cations. Uh, the resulting ion is smaller than its original atom. Uh, fewer electrons are pulled in by the same number of protons. So the the ion actually becomes smaller than its original uh, element. Nonmetals gain electrons and they therefore are larger than their original element. Um, talk about the energy exchanges that happen as these bonds are formed. When an atom loses electrons, energy is absorbed or put into the system. Metals lose electrons, becoming positively charged, and this is called an endothermic process. 
So to uh, to release that electron, you've got to put energy into the atom to break that electron off. And then when the electron, uh, uh, when you gain an electron, uh, it is an exothermic process. So when an atom gains electrons, energy is released from the system. Nonmetals gain electrons and become negatively charged. So this is an exothermic process. When the last forms, energy is also released or it is an exothermic process. If it wasn't for this lattice formation, the whole process would be endothermic. But since when the lattice kind of rearranges itself, it releases more energy, all ionic compounds, the form of all ionic compounds, the total amount of energy is always released or it's always an exothermic process. It's always exothermic. Okay, so we have some uh, examples of, of ionic compounds. And like I said, these can be quite beautiful. Uh, we have a very uh, attractive crystalline uh, lattice here of, of brown, uh, kind of bronzy and gray color. This is iron 2 disulfide. And this is gypsonite or aluminum hydroxide. Um, my sister went through school and she became a geophysicist and uh, really proud of her. Uh, she also got an accounting degree later and now she works for a large energy co-op in northern Ohio. And so she combined her knowledge of science and math and accounting and business practices uh, and uh, has made a nice career out of that. So here's another pretty, pretty uh, uh, ionic crystal called amethyst, I guess. And that's really pretty. Uh, the, the purple and the reflection of light on that is quite uh, quite dramatic. It says here, lattice energy is the change in energy when an ionic compound is separated into its components parts. So we'll talk a little bit about lattice energy. The process of separation is endothermic and can be predictive, uh, can be predicted from the exothermic bond formation. All right, so when the, when the lattice is formed, it's exothermic, but then when you separate it out, it's endothermic. And the process of predicting uh, the endothermic exchange can be gleaned from the bond formation. So how, how much energy is uh, released can, uh, can predict how much uh, will be absorbed when you need to break the bonds apart. Okay, lattice energy is calculated by something called Coulomb's Law. And we will go over the parts of the Coulomb's Law here. Let's get them up here. So in Coulomb's Law, R is the radius, and that is the shortest distance between the ions. The Q1 and Q2 are the charges of the ions. And K is a constant that depends upon the composition of the solid. It's important to note here that this is a combination of the two ions and is not each individual ion, but is a constant calculated from the formation of this solid itself. And we will talk about this relationship between the value here, the lattice energy, and these variables. So in general, the greater the charge and the shorter the distance, the higher the lattice energy. And we'll formalize that in the next slide. So if you have highly charged ions that are very tightly held together and have short distances, you have a great lattice energy. Covalent bonding. I always say covalent bonds have been to kindergarten because they have learned to share. <laughs> so in covalent bonding, instead of one atom getting an electron and one atom giving it up, the electrons are shared between the atoms and the electrons have an attraction to both nuclei. So the electrons are traveling around these nucleuses 
and they're attracted to both nucleuses simultaneously and they move back and forth between the nucleus of the atom. So in covalent bonds, electrons are shared between the atoms. There's an electrostatic uh, attraction between the electron and the nucleus of the atoms involved in the bond. And you might put both atoms here just to emphasize that the electrons travel around both of the atoms. The affinity for the electrons is not strong enough for the electrons to be transferred and as in ionic bonding. And this whole thing of electronegativity will help us predict whether electrons are lost uh, and gained or if they're shared. And so the difference in electronegativity becomes super important here. And we'll give you some guidelines on looking on tables and being able to predict if it's going to be an ionic bond or a covalent bond. And then within covalent bonds, just because the electrons are shared doesn't mean they're equally shared. Sometimes one atom holds on to the electron for a longer period than the other and they create what we call partial positive and partial negative charges. So the difference in electronegativity between atoms determines the bond type. And here we have a, a chart of electronegativities. And you'll notice here that the nonmetals compete, uh, ability to compete for electrons is a lot greater than the metals. So metals tend to lose the electrons and nonmetals tend to gain them. And so in our example of sodium and chloride, sodium chloride, you can see that there's a definite advantage for the chlorine atoms to gain the electrons and a definite tendency to lose electrons here because of the relatively low ability to compete for those electrons, only 0.93 here. And so that's what these numbers mean. And you'll notice the definite pattern here of increasing in electronegativity as you go towards the non-metal side. The greater the difference, the greater the ionic character or polarity of the bond. So in uh, ionic bonds, we say that those are highly polar. You've got a definite positive and negative pole. Uh, if the difference is kind of in between, you get a sharing, an unequal sharing of electrons. And so you have a partial uh, bond or a partial, a, a partial positive end and a partial negative end of the bond. And then if the, the difference is super small, then it's a a uh, non-polar bond in which the electrons are essentially shared equally between them. Okay, so here's the difference here. If the difference is greater than 1.9, the bond is considered to be ionic. If the difference is between 0 0.4 and 1.9, the bond is considered to be polar covalent. The electrons are not equally shared and there are partial positive and negative poles. Okay, so the difference is between 0 0.3 and 0, the bond is considered to be nonpolar covalent. The electrons are shared equally between the atoms and there's no net charge of the atoms. Um, some of the best examples of nonpolar covalent bonds are the diatomic elements, uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodide, and acetane. Well, acetane is, um, is not considered to be one of those because it's a, a radioactive element. So uh, these, uh, n these uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodide are all diatomic. So they have the same uh, electronegativity between the two atoms because they are, they're the same, right? F2 would be two fluorine atoms. Oxygen and nitrogen also are diatomic elements and they share their electrons equally as well as H2 or hydrogen. So these elements are all diatomic in their elemental form. So let's write those down. So those are the seven diatomic elements. They start on number seven on the periodic table and they kind of make a seven. Use your imagination there to make a seven. <laughs> kind of a weird looking seven. 
And so uh, you might ask yourself, well, what type of covalent bonds form between these? Well, nitrogen has six, I'm sorry, nitrogen has five uh, valence electrons, and we're going to write them a little bit differently than we normally would. And so it shares three pairs of electrons between the atoms. So we call this a triple bond, and you can write it like this or like this, just N2, right? We call this a structural formula, and we call this a molecular formula, okay? So oxygen has six valence electrons, and it shares two pair. So you'd write that as O2, or an oxygen atom with two lines in between it. So you have the uh, structural and molecular formulas uh, there and the dot structure, right? So what about fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodide and hydrogen? Well, chlorine has seven valence electrons as do all the other elements in group 17. So they form a single bond between them. All these would be the same. So you'd have Cl, Cl2. Hydrogen only has one valence electron, so it can only share one. So it forms a single bond as well. All right, so those are examples of single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. And in terms of bond strength and bond length, they uh, decrease as they get stronger. <laughs> so a triple bond is shortest in bond length, and then the double bond would be a little longer, and the single bond would be the longest. The triple bond here, the triple bond has the strongest bond, then the double bond, and then the single bond. All right. So you increase in strength as you increase the number of bonds. Uh, it's important to note here, though, that it's not twice as strong and it's not three times as strong. And that is because of the bond types and sharing uh, between the electrons. So you have in a single bond, let's see if I can pick up my pen here in a single bond we call this a sigma bond and in a sigma bond these are shared in the axial plane electrons shared in axial plane and this is the strongest type But in a double bond, you have a sigma bond and a pi bond. And the pi bond the electrons are shared above and below the plane of the molecule. And this is weaker. Okay. So, uh, and in a triple bond, when you have a triple bond, you have uh, one sigma and two pi. One sigma and two pi bonds. This is the other carbon atom involved there. Okay. So, single, double, and triple bonds. Triple bonds are the strongest. Double bonds are the next strongest, and then single bonds are weaker. You also have sigma and pi bonds within these types of bonding. Sigma bonds are the strongest, and pi bonds are weaker. And in terms of bond length, the longest is the single bond. The next longest, or the short, uh, next shortest, I guess you would say, is the double bond, and the very shortest length is with the triple bond. is a special type of bond where both the electrons are donated by one atom. Uh, so in this type of bonding, uh, you get uh, 
a situation like we have in the ammonia ion. And uh, with the ammonia ion, all the electrons are donated by the, uh, the nitrogen molecule here. And so you end up with uh, a, uh, a hydrogen uh, ion or a proton is, is involved in the bond, but the electrons are all donated by the nitrogen ion. And we have it depicted here is the ammonium NH4 ion. So this concludes uh, the first recording uh, in the bonding section. A lot of good information here. And in the next uh, recording, we will uh, summarize what we've covered so far with the bond types. We'll also talk about metallic bonding. And then we will go into nomenclature or naming and writing formulas for the different types of compounds. I hope you enjoyed this recording. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in uh, the next recording, recording two of unit five.